Beatlemania hits the United States. With sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the 60s shake American values. The work ethic, military duty, even family life are under attack. The Cold War continues, but for a generation, it's time to make love, not war. In 1960, America was moving towards the peak of its prosperity and power. The Democrats' choice to run for president was young Jack Kennedy, good-looking son of an Irish-American multimillionaire. The Kennedy family, but Jack in particular, and Jackie especially as well, just seemed to be the, the natural fulfillment of the American political process. They seemed to be the best that the process could bring forward and represented uh, a new and, and glittering age. You have to make your decision of what you want this country to be, what you want Illinois to be, how ready you are to move this country forward. That is the question which separates Mr. Nixon and myself. Kennedy brought in a sense of excitement and youth uh, after the um, kind of the sleepy Eisenhower years and almost seemed to symbolize this, uh, you know, youth passion. The Republican Party choice, Vice President Richard Nixon, shared Kennedy's patriotic anti-communist fervor. But he had not been groomed for television. The whole business of presenting visuals became very, very important. The Kennedy family put up hundreds of thousands of dollars, equipped a bus, it had film crews aboard, and they would go wherever John Kennedy was appearing and film him. And then those films became a part of his advertising on television. It was the first time that had really been done in a, an effective and organized way. Kennedy had attacked Eisenhower's conduct of the Cold War. To America and the world, he proclaimed, Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. Kennedy increased the military budget. Defense contracts brought the military-industrial complex unparalleled strength and riches. It meant more jobs. The Cold War was the noblest of enterprises, and it fit right in with the need for technologists like myself and the need for the government-sponsored programs that were opposing the Soviet advances. Attitudes were interesting at that time because the defense industry and its budgets seemed to be based on the fact that the Russians were 10 feet tall. Most of us were very hawkish about things. This was our life. I mean, the, our well-being, our sustenance was dependent on the defense industry. America was booming. The state of California, where much of the aerospace industry was based, became the sixth largest economy in the world. The big thing in those days was get into missiles, get into spacecraft, get into satellites. Big things are happening, and they're all happening out in California. Friends of ours were going to California because uh, Hughes, we understand, was building up uh, electronics place and 
Disneyland was hiring, and work was bad in Chicago in, in 56, 57, so we decided to move out here. Roll out those lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. Those days of soda and pretzels and beer. Roll out those lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. You wish that summer could always be Post-war settlers in California left behind the decaying cities of the East. They found suburban life in the sun affordable, idyllic. We would hang around the sales office until we saw the new plot map go up, and then we picked out the lot that we wanted. And uh, talking with the sales agent, we, he told us that Sunday morning we're going to open this this tract for buyers. And we said, what time are you opening Sunday morning? He told us we went to church early that day. By 8 o'clock, whenever he opened his doors, we were first in line. And for $200 cash uh, check written while we were in the place. We paid $10,999, which you tell somebody back to Chicago on that, and they think it was a, you were buying a barn, you know. And it was nice, it was three bedrooms, one bath, and we increased, we had to put the, we put a block wall fence, we put a patio out there, and we put uh, in the corner of our backyard, we put like a, like the uh, desert, we put a little cactus and stuff so we remind we're living in California. This good life was not available to all Americans. The question came up about uh, uh, selling uh, these homes to um, members of minorities, uh, ethnic minorities, blacks specifically. Um, and uh, it was, we were assured that we did not have to worry about anything of the sort happening, that, that, the, that the tract simply was not selling to blacks. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights had not removed the wedges of prejudice that were driven through American society. Black Americans, too, wanted freedom. Where Kennedy meant freedom from communism, they meant freedom from hunger, from fear, from humiliation. We looked at racism by degree, you know. So if you lived in St. Louis, you say, well, it could have been worse, you could be in Mississippi. You know, if you lived in Mississippi, you say, well, they, we lucky they didn't kill us all, that type of piece. And, and so consequently, and if a black person rose up and, and fought back, they say he's crazy nigga. Even black folks say he's crazy. Now somebody had to say, hey, it's all right when something is wrong to say it's wrong. And in a democracy, if something's wrong and you say it's wrong, you can gather to petition your government to tell them it's wrong. And you know what? If you do, they might do something about it. That's essentially what the Civil Rights Movement was about. You better keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on, hold on. In many southern states, laws prevented blacks and whites traveling together, eating together, even going to the same school. So keep your eyes on that prize, hold on, hold on. Black Americans were denied jobs and the right to vote. Civil rights activists demonstrating against unjust laws were careful not to provoke the police by any display of aggression. They were beaten just the same. It wasn't the first time armed whites had assaulted unarmed blacks, but now television was watching. Discrimination against blacks damaged America's credibility as freedom's champion in the Cold War. 
Kennedy was being urged by his brother, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, to back the civil rights movement. Aware that he needed the votes of white Southerners, Kennedy found it difficult to commit himself. August 28, 1963, a civil rights rally at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington urged the White House to ban racist laws and give black Americans equal job opportunities. A quarter of a million people showed up to listen to a 34-year-old Southern Baptist minister. Let freedom ring and if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. When we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I never heard King say one thing when that camera was on about white folks, and another thing when it was off. He never called them honkies, he never called them rednecks. He always had the same love. Now I'm talking about when just he and I in a room talking, I'm cussing and and calling him everything I can think of, and blah, blah, blah. And he never left that spirit of love. Governor, thank you very much. And don't get hurt yourself. Governor. Don't get run over, see? <laughs> thank you very Glad much. Thank you, George Wallace, Democratic governor of Alabama, saw the growing civil rights movement as part of a communist conspiracy. The Communist Party USA has been alert to capitalize on every possible issue or event which could be used to exploit the American Negro in furtherance of party aims. In its efforts to influence the American Negro, the party attempts to infiltrate the legitimate Negro organizations for the purpose of stirring up racial prejudices and hatred. In this way, the party strikes a blow at our democratic form of government by attempting to influence public opinion throughout the world against the United States. In the name of national security, Attorney General Robert Kennedy gave the FBI permission to tap the telephones of Martin Luther King and his colleagues. J. Edgar Hoover, chief of the FBI, was convinced that the civil rights movement had been infiltrated by communists. Hoover hated King. Hoover is close enough to the South to be in the Southern culture. And in that society, uh, there was a real sense of belief, a religious belief, a political belief that the, uh, there was no such thing as equality between blacks and whites. Hoover had coverage by agents listening to the wiretap 24 hours a day. We had scuttlebutt and uh, rumor and, uh, about his personal life. The, we didn't have facts to show that King was a communist. In the build-up to the 1964 election campaign, President Kennedy took his wife on a ceremonial visit to Dallas. There, he met his death. Americans tried to find outsiders to blame for their president's killing. There was a fear that the assassination might be the start of a communist attack on the United States. This is a sad time for all people. We have suffered a loss that cannot be weighed. For me, it is a deep personal tragedy. On the very night Johnson became president, when we flew back from Dallas on November 22, 1963, 
I was one of three people who sat with him in his bedroom. And that night, I learned he had sketched out the great society. And what he wanted to do is he said, now that I got the power, I aim to use it. This administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. And I urge this Congress and all Americans to join with me in that effort. In one of the richest countries in the world, millions of people were living in poverty, without decent housing, without health care, without education. What do you buy, a nice suit, jacket? Amongst blacks, unemployment was nine times that of whites. Central to Johnson's vision of the great society was the abolition of racial discrimination. In July 1964, Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill. He uses nearly a hundred pens to affix his signature and date. Souvenirs go to Republican leader Everett Dirksen and Democratic whip Hubert Humphrey. The president seems to have mastered the art of just touching each pen to the paper. Integration leader Martin Luther King receives his pen, a gift he said he would cherish. Attention all bases, attention all bases. This is Iron Hand, this is Iron Hand. This is a sack alert. The Cold War military buildup continued. The United States remained on high alert against a Soviet nuclear attack. It prepared to counterattack on an unimaginable scale. An increasing minority were questioning the cost and the effect on American life. They had deprived of billions and billions and billions and trillions of dollars of investment, trillions of dollars of war materials, secrecy, perquisites, uh, pride, in, an incredible conspiracy of silence surrounding what was supposed to be a democratic uh, uh, nation. The defense industry was a generous employer. The Pentagon presented the military machine as the defender of the American dream. The day begins and gives new meaning to the words of Walt Whitman. Everything comes out of the people, everyday people, the people as you find them and leave them. People. People. Just people. Life in this neighborhood was very, very good indeed. We all had jobs. We knew we were going to keep them. We all owned our homes. We were all white, middle class, approaching middle age. The children were very much the same size and shape. Fourth of July, all the uh, moms made their potato salads and their cold cuts. It was all out there in the middle of the cul-de-sac on picnic tables. We blocked off the end of the cul-de-sac. There was no traffic. The kids would play and they'd have their streamers and their tricycles, you know, all decorated. And, and uh, we would have a fine, fine time on the 4th of July. Throughout 1964, Johnson was on the campaign trail to get himself elected president and to build the great society. His Republican opponent was Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona. He voted against the Civil Rights Bill. Goldwater promised to get tough with the Soviets. He denounced Johnson's great society as creeping socialism. The message of our campaign is clear. It's this, stop the spread of socialism at home and communism abroad. The American people needed more convincing. Goldwater was heavily defeated. 
On the Berkeley campus of the University of California, dissent flourished. There had been a long tradition in Berkeley, going back many, many years, of distributing literature and giving political speeches and setting up tables promoting your political groups uh, right there on the campus grounds. Um, an edict came down which said that all of that ha must stop. The students borrowed the tactics of the civil rights movement. They organized strikes and sit-ins. In the confrontation with the students, the police became increasingly heavy-handed. The press and the public had little sympathy. Some of the press call, said that 49% of us were communists, and so you saw people wearing buttons saying, I'm part of the 49%, uh, which was a big deal. You see, this is a very important turning point because I was terrified of being called a communist. Absolutely terrified. I was going to be a public school teacher. This could end my career. To put that button on, to sing songs that we made up, like there are 5,000 students in the plaza, the microphone's loud, it's drawing a crowd, I'm sure that the rules say it's just not allowed. Uh, but to sing that, was, it would stick in my throat. Uh, because it was terrifying to be thought of as a communist. American ideas of political freedom were now being extended into the personal realm. The pursuit of happiness seemed incomplete without the exercise of sexual freedoms. The free enterprise system richly rewarded the adroit merchandising of sexual fantasy. Good evening. My name is Vera. Good evening. And I'm going to be your bunny tonight. The philosophy that I've always, uh, uh, that I grew up with and that I espoused in the editorial series was really personal freedom, political freedom, economic freedom with the emphasis on the personal, the notion that we indeed did and do own our own minds and bodies, and that anything from church or state that limits that uh, is inappropriate and inconsistent with uh, the pluralistic society that uh, America is supposed to be. People were saying that there was nothing automatically wrong about having sex before marriage. The birth control pill was available to students at the Student Health Service, uh, and most of the women I know were availing themselves of it. We agreed with the men that premarital sex was not an evil of thing for which you would die in eternal damnation. On the other hand, there were an awful lot of love them and leave them guys. So what exactly were the rules of this game? This was a tough time for women. American men were still marching off to war. In March 1965, President Johnson began sending ground troops to Vietnam. Inside the Army base at Oakland, California, a scene reminiscent of the recent past, the years of the Korean and World War II campaigns is reenacted by yet another generation of young Americans. I looked on uh, Vietnam initially as the country is potentially at risk. Here's another opportunity to demonstrate strength to the communist world, as it were. Our skills, scientific, technical, manufacturing, whatever it might be. What a wonderful opportunity. Kennedy's famous inaugural address in which he said, ask not what you, uh, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, uh, was really the rallying cry for my generation, at least a part of my generation. We were the new Romans who faced the barbarians and the frontiers of the new Rome. I joined the Marines out of that sense of patriotism, and uh, once we were sent to Vietnam, this was all considered to be right and fitting. This is what we were supposed to do. Silver wing upon their chest These are men, America's best Despite the extension of the military draft, Johnson's war in Vietnam enjoyed popular support. When 
the green beret. While some young Americans went off to war in Vietnam, others were seeking thrills of a different kind. They rejected American materialism, not for communism, but for love, peace, and rock and roll. All over the country, young men of draft age turned on, tuned in, and dropped out. It was fun to make people say, oh, look at the freaks, or isn't a girl or a boy, or things like that. Uh, unless it was someplace where people were really hostile and wanted to beat you up, it was kind of fun. I, I to this day, think that it's young people's job to horrify older people. I think the first reaction of most of us who were veterans and were working hard and trying to raise a family, suddenly confronted with a generation that seemed not to give a damn. They wore beads and earrings and they smoked marijuana, which was a thing to do, and they spoke a different language. These young Americans rejected the work ethic and monogamy for spontaneity, sensuality, and psychedelic drugs. There was the cosmic consciousness, there was being God, there was understanding it all now, and I became, in short order, pretty impatient with the rest of the world. They're still having wars, they're doing stupid things. Mostly, the flower children did their own thing. The police, obliged to play the heavy father, were often totally at a loss. I really did think the revolution was going to happen. I, not necessarily guns and, and blood. I, if pressed, I might have had a hard time saying just what I thought was going to happen. The one thing I was fond of saying was there are more of us being born and more of them dying all the time. And I really thought that all we had to do was show them. And once people realized, oh yeah, this is a better way to live. Love is much better than war. The vast majority of Americans spurned youth counterculture. Hollywood film star Ronald Reagan was out to become Republican governor of California. Feels very good. Reagan urged a massive effort to win the war in Vietnam. I have always felt that we should be making an all-out effort to win. Does that imply you don't think the government is? Well, I think for quite some time, and I, and I still believe, I have agreed with those military men and those who have suggested that uh, perhaps more of a blockade with regard to North Vietnam, the blocking of the harbor and so forth, to. Uh, stop the shipments of munitions in, as well as trying to uh, intercept them on their way south, uh, would be more effective. More bombing? Uh, yes. But protest against the war was growing. There were marches and draft card burnings. The war, these Americans argued, was immoral and unjust. It felt like we were walking around in a large mass hallucination sustained by all the politicians, but particularly Lyndon Johnson and later by Nixon extremely, based on lies and secrecy, sustained by the media who were not able to, who couldn't conceive that the whole structure of the United States mentality could be so wrong and so disastrous and so earth destroying. I had the opportunity to travel to uh, Vietnam and see firsthand some of the things that were going on. And I, I studied and read quite a bit about it. And I became quite convinced that there just was no basis to be there. And that in time that we could bring the whole country, you know, to that, that point of view. At the Oakland Draft Induction Center, Berkeley students organized a blockade trying to prevent conscripts registering for military service. 
The army was forced to bust the conscripts in behind a massive police cordon. I do remember the first time I was maced. That wasn't particularly um, fun. It was very typical for the police lines there and the student line is here and they're sort of this, you know, ritualized back and forth. Well, we're going through this ritualized back and forth and this guy takes out this can and sprays it in your face and um, you're blinded. You know, you feel blinded, you're temporarily blinded and you don't know what the hell is. And of course, never happened before, so if you're temporarily blinded, you don't know. It doesn't come with the word temporary in front of it. You don't know what the hell's happened. Call it peace or call it treason, call it love or call it reason, but I ain't working anymore. I ain't working anymore. Most Americans still supported President Johnson's war in Vietnam. Some saw the anti war protesters as little more than traitors. 99% of the people in this country are terrific Americans and disagree entirely with flag burnings, carrying enemy colors, giving medical supplies to the enemy, etc. Many could not understand why Johnson did not use more of America's massive firepower to end the war. But Johnson did not want to risk a wider conflict. Johnson's sole motivation was to try, as we say in Texas, to haul ass out of that war. Get out of there. He didn't know how to do it. He could not just unilaterally retreat and, and take the soldiers out. Uh, then every right-wing enemy would have said, you coward, you poltroon, you disgrace the American nation, and you in a sense spat on its flag because you put your tail between your legs and you ran. Johnson's war dragged on. By the end of 1967, there were half a million American soldiers in Vietnam. We had an anti-war rally with a focus on the fact that 26, 28 percent of the people who were dying on the front lines in Vietnam were black Americans whose same rights were not being recognized in this country. And the whole focus was down with the war, and black people do not serve in the military. Millions took notice when heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali defied the draft. He declared his allegiance to a non-American cause, Islam. Shortly put, are the black Muslims taking you I for a ride? Not. I said not black Muslims, Muslims. I beg your pardon, are the Muslims taking no, you for a ride? No, the white people have been taking us for a ride for the past 400 years in America. In the black ghetto of Oakland, California, activists trained as paramilitaries in what they saw as a civil war against a racist police force. Led by Huey Newton, they called themselves the Black Panthers. Where the peaceniks offered flowers, the Panthers pointed guns. We took our guns with us to let the police know that we have an equalizer, and we're going to exercise, as Huey used to say, this constitutional right to observe you whether you like it or not. That's what Huey says is right on, Huey. That's what we're doing. But the police at one point says, you have no right to observe me. He says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out his duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. A reasonable distance of that particular ruling was constituted as 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you, and I'll observe you whether you like it or not. Now, you have to imagine 30 or 40 black folks standing by and listening to this stuff. And some women say, well, go ahead on and tell it, brother. I mean, that's called, that's capturing the imagination, the feelings, the emotion. Some other blacks say, man, he scratches his head. 
What kind of Negroes is these? America's black ghettos were now war zones. In the summer of 1967, there were riots in Newark and Detroit. In Detroit, the police asked for a war budget of $9 million to buy military equipment. For too many Americans, Johnson's great society was a sham. In March 1968, as the war in Vietnam and conflict at home continued, Johnson threw in the towel. He declared he would not run for a second term as president. Martin Luther King still pursued his dream. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The following night, Martin Luther King was killed by a white gunman. Behind the mule wagon carrying King's coffin was a bareheaded Bobby Kennedy. He was grieving and campaigning to become the Democrats' next presidential candidate. The country wants to move in a different direction. We want to deal with our own problems within our own country, and we want peace in Vietnam. Bobby Kennedy won the California primary. His rival, fellow Democrat Eugene McCarthy, was also for peace. McCarthy supporters watching television saw another Kennedy killed by an assassin's bullet. I found my wife, Terry, on the sofa, uh, weeping at uh, dawn, you know, because I missed, I realized she wasn't in bed, where is she? I went out looking, she's on the sofa, she's weeping. And uh, of course the news is still rolling, you know, and, and the, the, the playbacks of the assassination, and I just could not come to grips with that one. I thought this, this proves it, you know, that their good men are being sent to slaughter. August 1968, Democratic Party delegates arrive in Chicago for the convention to choose their candidate for the presidential elections in November. The burning issue was the war in Vietnam. Vice President Hubert Humphrey was confident he would win the nomination. He supported Johnson's dream of a great society and, in public, the war in Vietnam. The hopes of the anti-war faction within the Democratic Party now lay with Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota. When I moved into my headquarters in the hotel, I had Secret Service. They were very honest people. They said, look, this room is not bugged. You can say anything here, but don't talk on the telephone because you've been tapped. We know you're tapped. The authorities were nervous. A hundred thousand anti-war demonstrators were expected in Chicago. We permit people, we don't care who they are, to come to Chicago and visit us. And we will permit people to carry on their rights as American citizens, to petition and demonstrate. But there's no 
person, any place, anywhere, or any thousands of them that will come to Chicago and take over our streets, our convention, or our city. The present day politicians and their armies of automatons have selfishly robbed us of our birthright. The evilness they stand for will go unchallenged no longer. Political pigs, your days are numbered. We are the second American revolution. We are winning. Yippee! The demonstrators gathered in the city's parks in preparation for a march on the convention hall. Mayor Daly had no intention of allowing them to march anywhere and wanted them out of the parks. They wanted a focal point, and a focal point would be the park. Daly said, you can't sleep in a park. They said, we're going to sleep in a park. That was their, their main focus, because they knew there'd be a confrontation. The was out of order. That's what causes Inside the convention, Daly prevented McCarthy delegates debating the war on primetime TV. I was pretty upset because the... Of the Democratic Party and let them conduct themselves accordingly or clear the gallery. Will the convention be, will the sergeant at arms enforce order in the convention? On the day the Democratic Party was due to nominate its presidential candidate, anti war protesters battled it out with police. It was quite an experience really having, uh, I don't know, the numbers, you know, 40, 50 policemen yelling, kill Davis, uh, with a much bigger group behind them. And uh, the first uh, hit was to the head and drove me to the ground. And then it was just being beaten on the back, you know, over and over again. It was, uh, I would say, probably the only time in my life where I really thought I might not make this. As the Democratic Party convention lined up behind Humphrey, the peaceniks made one last attempt to march on the convention hall. The police were waiting for them, and for anyone else who stayed in the street. majority of people supported the Chicago Police and Convention. I think there was a poll afterwards where about 78% of the people in the U.S. supported uh, the Chicago Police. At the convention, McCarthy supporters were overwhelmed. Vice President Hubert Humphrey became the Democrats' candidate for the presidential elections in November. He would face a tough and seasoned Republican Party opponent. When the strongest nation in the world can be tied down for four years in a war in Vietnam with no end in sight, when the richest nation in the world can't manage its own economy, when the nation with the greatest tradition of the rule of law is plagued by unprecedented lawlessness, when a nation has been known for a century for equality of opportunity is torn by unprecedented racial violence. And when the President of the United States cannot travel abroad or to any major city at home without fear of a hostile demonstration, then it's time for new leadership for the United States of America. He was saying, I'm tougher, I'm smarter, I understand the world better. Uh, my opponents are divided. They've been taken over by the uh, fringe elements of the Democratic Party. 
and a bunch of loonies are in charge. Uh, we're stable. We have a sense of direction. You know where we stand on things. You can confide in us. And we won't let the Russians or the Chinese push us around. Richard Nixon's victory was wafer thin, less than 1% of the vote. The Cold War and the war in Vietnam would continue.